Hello, everyone, and welcome to another session of the International Coaches Summit. Um, we have another great speaker. Uh, after a little bit of technical difficulties, we got it ironed out. And uh, Coach David Gale is here with us now. Uh, luckily for us, he's the uh, head coach of Porsche Basketball Academy in Germany. Uh, and today he's going to be talking about building your offense through player development. So, uh, Coach, I'm super excited to hear your presentation today. Uh, I, I hope everyone participates in the Q&A. So if you have any questions or comments, uh, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will get to those uh, at the end of the presentation. So, uh, Coach, thanks again so, so much for joining us. Uh, take it away. Uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and share this with you guys. Um, let me uh, go ahead and, and find my presentation here to share it with you guys. And we can uh, jump right into it. So there we go. Um, so, you know, first, uh, I, I want to start off by saying, you know, I, there's a lot more aspects to player development than what I'm going to discuss here. Um, I, I really want to hit on the, the topic of how to build your player development into your offensive development and, and um, your team identity. So uh, with that said, you know, I think I'm really big on, on defining um, what you're doing, having a plan for what you're doing. So uh, that was kind of, uh, you know, imparted to me by some coaches I worked with when I was very young in the video room in the NBA. Um, they always said, you know, kind of map out what you're going to do. So I found this quote. Uh, I think it really speaks to the way I work with my guys and how we kind of try and do things. So, you know, as you see here, seek opportunities to show you care. Uh, the smallest gestures often make the biggest difference with your players. And I think that's, that's very accurate. Um, players really notice the little things, whether you think they do or they don't. Um, so, so to me, when I, when I talk about player development, um, to me, player development is anything that makes your player a better basketball player, uh, a smarter, more complete, and better person, um, a better teammate. Um, coaching player development to me is really – Really, everything we do, um, you know, I think you're always developing your guys. I, I don't think it's just the skill work side of it. So, uh, you know, moving on from there, once you define what player development is, now you have to kind of define what your philosophy is and how you're going to get anybody to listen to you. Uh, you know, unless you're – I've had the opportunity to work for some guys. Like, I work for Jerry Stackhouse. And, and when you're Jerry Stackhouse, you know, he's a great coach and he's always prepared. But guys, listen to him because he's – also because he's Jerry Stackhouse. Uh, so for a guy like myself, who the highest level I play was Division One college basketball, how do I get guys to buy into what I'm telling them to do or asking them to do rather, I should say. So, you know, first off, I think honesty, honesty, you know, you're told as a kid, honesty is the best policy. Honesty is really the way to go with your guys. Players respect honesty. It builds trust with your guys. They can see through some of the bull and I think a player, whether they want to hear it, um, you know, as a positive or a negative, at the end of the day, they want you to be honest with them and tell them where they really stand. Um, and, and the next step would be transparency. And that kind of goes hand in hand. So I think you need to be clear about where they are, um, how they fit into your system, um, you know, how you're going to get to where you want to get to with them, what the plan is, um, you know, their, their players are, are much more responsive when they feel like they're a part of the process. So being very clear and open and transparent with your guys is, is extremely important. Positivity is the next. And for me, you know, I go to put positivity is number one. Um, I, I've worked for, or I shouldn't say I've worked for, I think all of us have been around guys who are not positive. Um, and, and the first person I, I worked for that really imparted this on me was Dwayne Casey. And, uh, players or sorry, coaches love to have their, you know, what we call bitch sessions where you, you're, you're, this guy stinks at this, this guy can't do this. How do we get through to him? And, and coach Casey said one day in a, in a coach's meeting, you know, these are our guys. I, I don't want to hear anymore what they can't do. Uh, I, we got to figure out what they can do. So that to me was the first step in, in really understanding you have to be positive with your players. Um, positivity breeds confidence. When you're positive with your guys, they feel more confident. They feel more like they can 
they can do something. Um, and then in turn, confidence, confident players help you win games. Um, confident players help you build your program. You know, uh, I'm really big and we'll get to it as, as I go on, but your terminology, the words you use, I think taking a negative word and somehow turning into a positive word uh, is another way to, to use positivity with your guys. And I'll give some examples as, as we go on. Um, authenticity, right? Be you, be who you are. Players, players can really tell when you're trying to be fake or trying to be someone you're not. Just be yourself, you know? Ultimately, the, the players um, want someone they can talk to, want someone they can connect with, not just someone who's gonna tell them what to do. And if you're not being yourself, they're gonna be able to see right through it and, and it's gonna, everything you're trying to build is, is gonna fall apart through one thing or another. Um, so uh, with that, you know, being authentic, being transparent, I think communication is key. Communication with your guys uh, is, is really, really big, especially when you're working with younger players. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, to work at the NBA level in the video room and then as a player development coach and then uh, as an assistant in the G League. And so when you go from the NBA, where, which is getting younger and younger every year, uh, to the G League, which is even younger, and then now I'm coaching one of the top U19 teams in Europe, uh, it's really important the younger you get, the more clear you are with your communication. Uh, younger players, you can't assume they know what you're talking about. You can't assume any guy knows what you're talking about, but, but the younger you get, the less likely they are to have seen what you're trying to tell them. So uh, be very clear. Simplify everything you're trying to tell them, uh, especially you know, if you're an American coach like myself coming to Europe, you, you have to know these guys. Maybe they don't understand what you're saying because they don't understand English. So communication is key in getting the results you want. Um, and then lastly, with my, my philosophy in getting these guys to buy in is, is teaching them responsibility. So that can mean a lot of different things. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing is it's important for your players to understand that everything you're doing is to help them, right? Everything you're doing is for their growth to help them get better. So, um, you know, they need to learn how to push themselves. They need to learn how to take ownership in, in their own development. You're here and you can push them, but at the end of the day, all of this is for them. So by giving them input, uh, by allowing them to, you know, through different uh, practices, uh, take some ownership in their own development in, in the team, you, you allow them to understand that it's their responsibility to get better at the end of the day. Uh, so from there, I, I, I move on to, you know, what my philosophy is in, building these players. And like I said, you know, we'll, we'll get to how you build your, your offense through your player development, but I really think it's important to, to explain um, my philosophy in building players and in, in um, how you get them to buy in before you can get to that next step. So first off, as I, you know, some of the things I described already, um, may, it might be a little repetitive, but you know, through the honesty, you build relationships and trust. Uh, these players have to understand that you care about them more as a person than you do as an athlete. It, that, that is one of the things I've learned and I've built relationships that have lasted for years and years because of it. So if you treat these guys like a commodity or, or like a piece, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna trust you whatsoever. They're gonna see that you're in this for your personal gain. I think it's really, really important to get them to understand that you care about them as a person. How do you do that? Uh, discover what their interests are off the court. Ask them about their families. Go out, have dinner with them. Um, go to a movie. Have team events where, where you're interacting with them off of the court. Um, next thing would be always be available. So when you get to the highest levels, whether it's uh, here where I'm an assistant with the BBL team or the EuroLeague or the NBA, uh, you know, you really uh, have to always be available whenever the players need you and put the players' interests ahead of your own. Now, if you uh, get the opportunity to be a head coach, you know, you can, you can uh, kind of set your non-negotiables. You know, after 8 p.m. at night, I'm with my family. Or on Sundays, 
you know, Sundays are off, whatever, whatever your non-negotiables might be uh, as a head coach. But if you're an assistant or you're a video coordinator uh, or you're at the lower levels um, of, you know, anything below the NBA really, or, or very high level division one or Euro league, you have to always be available, put the player's interests ahead of your own. Uh, bring positivity and energy every single day. Uh, as a younger coach, sometimes that's hard. That's hard to do or hard to understand. But I think through my uh, experiences, you know, I had coaches who have told me that. And um, I think you really have to understand that we, we get paid to coach basketball. We get paid uh, to, to be big kids, essentially, at the end of the day um, and, and play and, and teach a game and play a game. And so there's really no reason you shouldn't be positive and energetic every day to come to work. If you're dreading going to work as a basketball coach, there's something wrong and you should find another, uh, another uh, profession. So you really set the tone for the workouts, right? You set the tone for your guys. Bring that energy every single day if you want them to have energy and positivity. Uh, I work with a coach here who said this, and uh, I'm sure we all kind of feel this way, but he's dead on in it. You know, the modern player does not need to get excited for you. You need to get them excited. Um, you know, it might have been different back in the day where coaches, coaches say do it and you do it. But now you have to get them excited to be there sometimes. They'd rather go play video games or hang out with their friends or, or sit on Instagram. Um, so, you know, bring that positivity and energy. Uh, your terminology. Uh, I'm, like I said, I'm very big on the words you use. I think words are extremely powerful. So take a negative word um, or words with no meaning um, and, and kind of change them around to build your culture. Uh, you know, I listened to a coach uh, speak a couple of weeks ago, the head coach of Cal Baptist, Rick Croy, and he said it, and I really truly believe it and I've adopted it. Your terminology becomes your culture. The words you use every single day becomes the culture and the environment you are building. Players repeat the things you say every day. Um, so, so saying, you know, um, move, move, move. What does move mean? You know, uh, if you want them to split, if you want them to 45 cut, if you want them to screen away, be very direct with the words you use. Um, in the same vein, you know, like if you're talking about guarding uh, on a down screen, do you want them to trail the play? Because trail has a very negative connotation or chase. If you're chasing, you're already beat. So for example, you know, the places I've been before and, and here we, you know, we say war, you know, be physical, get through the screen, war through it. You're not trailing now and you're not chasing, you're warring through it. It's a positive, aggressive word. Um, you know, as well as that, uh, I say we, we use the same words to mean, the words we use mean the same thing all the time. So uh, rather than using a dribble handoff, I don't say dribble handoff. We go toss game. So I want the ball to be tossed rather than handed off. So all the time, whether it's in a drill, um, whether it's in the game, whether we're, we're getting iced or pushed or whatever word you might use, toss always means the same thing. So the guys know if they hear me say toss game, toss game, they know what I want from them. Um, so then the next thing for me would be sweat equity. And, and what I mean by that is uh, get on the court and sweat with your guys. You know, really, uh, you know, some coaches, maybe the older coaches, it's a little different. But if you're a young coach, uh, get on the court, sweat with them. Uh, you know, it shows your buy-in. It shows you're in it with them. They, they really got – players really believe in that stuff and they buy into it. Um, Another thing, players, you know, generally will listen to a coach who can demonstrate it themselves. So if you can get on the court and you can show them what you want them to do rather than just tell them, they're probably more likely to listen to you. Um, again, uh, another step of it, you know, I, I had the opportunity to, to go out and guard Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan. And, I, you know, these players were told to do things and I was kind of directing them. And then you get out there and you can feel – what they're actually doing. You put your hands on them and you feel them and you understand their movements a little bit better. You understand what they should be doing or what the defense is doing and they can teach you as well at the same time. Um, and then lastly, you know, I kind of, I kind of hinted at it, but when you get on the court and sweat with your guys, it changes your relationship. In my experience, it has always made the relationship closer. If I've been on the court sweating with the players, 
uh, from there is no instance where I have gotten on the court and I've sweat with my guys where it has not strengthened the relationship. So um, now skill development. So as, as you can see, to me, the most important parts of player development aren't even getting on the court. The first five pieces I've talked about here have nothing to do with what skills you're working on. So obviously as a coach, you're going to be judged on the results, right? So I think connecting with your guys in all these ways is the most, most important thing. Um, there's a million coaches who can teach skills. There's Instagram coaches, there's skill development coaches. There's, there's all these guys, everyone can teach these skills, but if you can connect with your guys, before you get to that skill development, you're just gonna be another coach. Um, so to me, the most important part of skill development, and I, I preach it to my guys, to my assistant coaches, uh, to my Twitter following, anybody who, who sees anything I put up there, the most important thing to me is teach your players how to play. Do not teach them plays. Don't teach them how to run sets necessarily, but teach them how to make reads on those sets. Teach them what the counters are to those sets, how the ball should move, how they should move. So a lot of our skill development stuff that I'll get to when I show these videos is about movements and making reads. And that's to me how you build your player development into your offense development. Uh, so I'll hit on a really quickly technology. I think all of us have different ways to break down our film. Uh, it's very important that you connect with your players in ways that they can understand nowadays. So we have team film sessions, we have one-on-one -on -one film sessions, and then you send film to the guys, whether you have huddle, um, whether you use Instagram, whether you email it to them, um, find the ways that your players best react to technology. And then if you're at the highest levels, you have player tracking, you have advanced stats, but use technology to develop your players. Uh, every single workout we do, we try and incorporate live competition. Um, you can be creative with it in shooting drills, in one-on-one -on -one, and two-on-two, but always try and figure out a way to, to make live competition a part of every workout you have. Um, and then lastly, make it fun. It's a game. And a lot of people on this, I would imagine, are coaching younger players. Make it fun. You have to remind these guys it's a game. It's a game, and they played it at one point because it was the most fun thing to them. So make your workouts fun, laugh with the guys, let them goof around every so often. Um, because if you want them to listen to you when you're yelling and screaming at them, you also have to let them um, have a little bit of fun in, in what you're doing with them. So I, I believe this is the last slot I have here and then we'll get to some film. Um, as I hinted at, you know, now we're getting to how does player development get into your offense? Have a plan. Always have a plan. Have a long-term plan. Have a short-term plan. Have a vision for your team. In order to get your player development to work <clears throat> um, towards building a goal, you have to have a goal. You have to have a plan. So you can build your player development to get to that plan or get to work into that plan. Um, it allows you to determine where to start and how to break down your drills. And then secondly, I've, again, I've kind of uh, talked about it briefly, but players can really, really tell when you have a plan and when you don't have a plan, when you're winging it and when you really know what you want out of them. I've been around both situations and players know. Players know when you know what you want. Say, so, you know, for example, if you come into a workout and, and you're, you kind of go step by step and you're, you're thinking a lot or you're, you're, um, this, uh, maybe, uh, that they know they can tell they read signs. Players are really good at reading people. So have a plan, um, be transparent, communicate with your players, what the plan is. Uh, so occasionally I do think it's okay to go into a workout knowing the basic layout and then wing it yourself, but have a basic layout of what you want to do and test yourself. Can I come up with something on the fly? But as a, as a overall theme, have a plan for what you want. Um, determine what your identity is as a team. That goes into having a plan. So what are your offensive rules? Do you 45 cut, slot cut? Uh, do you flare on the backside? Do you post split when the ball goes inside? Or do you jet cut or speed cut uh, and, and stagger away? 
you know, there's a million ways to do things, but what do you do? What's your transition spacing? Uh, what's your flow offense when everything breaks down, right? What's your make offense? What's your miss offense? So in having all these things mapped out, uh, you are able to develop your, your player development segments a little more thoroughly and um, productively. So along with that, what do you value as a team? Are you going to be a team where you have an inside post presence and you want to throw it inside? Or are you a team that values the three? Um, or penetration, passing, ball movement? You know, all, you'll see through the drills that we do here what we value and how we work that into what our player development is. Um, and then I think simplifying things is really, really important. It goes along with communication. And um, so I have a saying that I've shared with my coaches and I don't think the players necessarily need to hear it because this is to their benefit. But if you want to share with them, that's fine. Um, slow minds create slow feet. So a player who is constantly thinking about what they have to do next will not be moving very quickly, will not be moving instinctively. The more simple you make it for your players, the more instinctively they eventually will be able to play once they learn what it is you want them to do. So, um, you know, uh, I had a coach the first year I worked with the, the 905 team, and I always go back to this. We were playing one of our last games of the season. He wanted to switch everything, switch everything on ball, off ball, no matter what it was. And it was my scout. So I put all this effort into what, how are we going to guard people? What, what's our pick and roll coverage? And they had Dante Jones. They had Dante Jones, and we had a 5'8 point guard who ended up playing over here in Germany this year named John Jordan. So how is John Jordan going to guard Dante Jones in the post? Uh, you know, so we go into the game. We want to switch everything. We ended up winning the game by 35 points. Now, we also hit a ton of threes, and we had an amazing offensive game. But at the same time, I was convinced at that point, simple is better. Simple is always better. So maybe not switching everything, but simplify it for your players, and they're going to play way more instinctively. Uh, as I mentioned, use your terminology in your workouts, in your one-on-one -on -one, one, or one-on-o -on workouts, your five-on-o -on workouts, your team workouts, your player development sessions, your film sessions, no matter where it is, use your terminology. Because as I said, your culture will be defined by the words you use. Um, build confidence and comfort in your players, right? So a more confident player, a more comfortable player is going to be a better player more than likely. So a player that's comfortable in your offense, in your offensive movements, is probably going to be a better player in your system. So um, put them in your system. Put them in your movements. Use your player development sessions as another practice time while you're still working on individual skills. And I'll show that again in the videos we get to next. But um, it's just another – your workouts are just another time to build the habits you want to see once they get into a five-on-five -five session. Um, so I, I skipped over it briefly, but in your terminology, right, in the terminology, um, it helps to understand the pieces of your offense as well. So as I said, we name our slot cut. We name our flare screen. So as you're working with the guys, say, you know, it, it's a, it, our, our slot cuts are called 40, or are called, sorry, are called Maccabi cuts. So you'll see it. We do a workout where it's just Maccabi cuts, and then we dictate the finishes to them. So use the same term, terminology all the time. Um, and then lastly, right, I talked about teaching the movements and reads and building their IQ. So your breakdown offense, you should show the whole set. This is what I truly believe. Show the whole set, right, then break down the pieces of the set, then go back to showing the whole set. And I know a lot of people hear this, whole, part, whole. And I really believe that is, is um, very effective to teaching your players. So you can do it in, um, in dictating what their finishes are, and, and you would call that maybe block training. And then you can do it where you call out numbers or you have a coach out there where they're maybe coming over on the baseline help, maybe the nail help, maybe they leave, maybe they stunt, and, and use your coaches in these workouts. Instead of having the players go live, on, live against each other, your coach is letting your players make reads, and that, that way the – the individual skill workouts become a little more random instead of just dictated and block workouts. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, 
uh, the last part of that, when you throw your coaches in there, I heard someone say this, and I really, really loved it. It's a guy I worked with in Toronto named John Corbasio, who's now with the Raptors and is a player development coach there. He said, bones over cones. Put your, put your coaches in the workouts. Let these players feel your coaches, uh, sweat equity, the whole deal, right? The cones are great when you don't have extra coaches and extra bodies, but if you have coaches, throw them out there. Um, so, you know, this is the, my six step process in these workouts, simplify it like we talked about. I'm huge on balance. Balance is the most important part and you'll see it in the finishing drills we do. Every time, everything we do gets back to balance, balance, balance. Um, we do a ton of footwork drills. We do a ton of shooting drills because we really value the three ball. And I think the modern, modern game, if you can't shoot, you're probably going to be phased out of the game eventually. Uh, as I hinted at, basketball IQ, right? Build the reads, build, um, build the guy's understanding of how to make reads and how to move. And then competition. We talked about competition. Um, you know, always, 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 always build a competitive mindset in your guys. Whatever you can do to make it a competitive drill, whether it's live or a shooting drill or a finishing drill, whatever it is, make them compete against one another. Make them compete against themselves or against you. If it's a one-on-one -on -one workout like you see in that picture there, uh, you know, for example, that's the Mar DeRozan shooting floaters. If he missed it, I got a point. If he made it, he got a point. So now he's competing against himself in a one-on-one -on -one workout. Always make it competitive. Um, and the, la the last thing, I don't want to skip it because it says it right there. Start at the start with everything you do. Every player is different. Every player is different. Do not skip steps. As much as you might want to skip steps, skip steps in your workouts, start at the start, figure out who each player is and how you can build them up and, and make them better. Um, so here, we'll get right into the video now. So footwork. Um, we do a lot of stuff here that's ladder. So ladder drills um, and defense, we call them defensive footwork drills, but they're really just footwork drills. So the footwork drills for players in the United States um, or, or, or Canada, you might see them as maybe soc um, soccer drills or football drills, American football drills, the way, they're, the, way the players move their footwork. So um, I'll jump right into it here. Let me mute it. Um, so you'll see here, we do a lot of ladder work with our guys. And this is usually at the start of practice. Um, it, here we do it, you know, with ball handling in order to get our guys to understand balance, to understand the, the cognitive, cognitive mindset of doing two things at once. Um, so we build our ball handling into our footwork drills uh, a lot of times. And you see that this workout here, everybody in this workout is six, five or over with, uh, two of them, the, the, the second and the third guy in the drill being 6'8". So we do the same drills with our bigs as we do with our guards. Um, I'll skip ahead because this is some basic stuff. And then we get a little more creative. Um, we'll call this skier jumps here. So side to side. And now you see their, the ball is going around the waist instead of them dribbling it. Um, you saw in the beginning, it was right hand on one side, left hand on the other side. Right? So I have, um, I'm lucky enough to have my assistant coach, who was a 15-year uh, Bundesliga basketball player and also has his license to be an athletic trainer. Uh, so we kind of, you know, uh, were able be to, to hit on multiple, <laughs> multiple different um, things with one person, which kind of allows for your, you know, the lower budget programs. Um, you know, we're not all lucky enough to have 10 coaches like NBA teams or, or EuroLeague teams or high level division one teams, you know, so we have to mix in. He's got to wear multiple hats. Like myself, I, I'm the head coach of this team, as well as the head coach of our, our Regan Aliga team and an assistant coach with the pro team. So uh, we have to wear different hats and, and, and we do it pretty well. You know, you see here, these guys are struggling with the footwork a little bit. And I'll say this, that player was here with me for one year and now he's a division one college player. So it's kind of interesting to me the American mindset. I grew up in the U.S. I, I was schooled that way, and then I came here and I see basketball players doing things you don't really see basketball players doing a lot of. Um, the U.S. player does not really do ladder work all the time. I think it's getting more and more. But when I was growing up in the '90s, we didn't do any of this stuff. Maybe I just had bad coaches. I don't think so. But um, so then we'll move on a little bit further. You see, now they're doing like um, one foot in, one foot out. 
Um, and then we get here, now we're doing cross steps and we'll build on this. So it was kind of basic, then it got a little more difficult. And this, you'll see this footwork in our defensive slides, right? So I, this is what I was talking about where you'll never see cross steps really, at least when I was growing up, I, I don't, I've never coached the youth in the United States or in Canada, um, but you'll never see cross steps taught in the, in the US for basketball players. You're always told when you're defensive sliding, keep your feet apart, okay? So we do this because we, we think it creates mobility, it creates a flexibility in your hips, it creates good, fast feet. Um, and then with that, now you see, we're kind of building in what we're trying to do on defense, which is keep their hands up at all times. And you'll see, we, we, I'll talk about that later when we move on to the defensive footwork side of it, but keep their hands up at all times. Um, so then I think the last one we see here, yeah, same drill, but they're going backwards now. So again, they're using their brains, they're, they're building their footwork up, they're building their agility, and, and they're working into what we want to be the next step of our player development. So you'll see here, now we call it, this is what we call defensive style footwork. So let me use it, I apologize. So now, it's, it's bounds, right? We want on balance all the time. They're bounding side to side, side to side, wide base. Now you see the same footwork you saw in the ladder, cross steps, right? And as you see, their hands are always above their heads. So again, it's building the mindset of what we want on defense. This is a way to work in defensive um, thought process into your skill work, into your player development. We track deflections. We track steals, we track charges, we track some things on defense. So you'll see here um, the, the player with the long sleeve on, he led us in deflections. His hands are always above his head when he turns and he slides. Um, so, and then at the end of the season, we track this stuff and we have a reward for the guys who have the most deflections. You know, whether it be um, my wife is the team cook, another way we wear multiple hats, he might get a free meal out of it. Um, so, now you'll see, so that's the base, right? Build a base, start at the start with all your guys. I, I didn't film any of our ball handling because I think um, everyone's seen a million ball handling drills and most of you probably have better ones than I do. But we do stationary, we do on the move, we do one ball, we do two ball. Um, I'm always stealing different stuff from different people, right? So ball handling is a huge part and you saw we built it into our ladder work there. So then we go on to finishing. Um, and as I said, you'll see it in the finishing drills. Right, I talked about balance. Balance always being extremely important. So this is the first thing we do with our, our finishing. It's bounds side to side, as we did in the defensive footwork, and now we're progressing to finishes. So it's, um, this one is left, left on the finish, and then when we go on the other side, we go right, right on the finish, but you can have them start going the other direction first. Have them go to the middle, then the baseline, then the middle, and then maybe you do a reverse layup or you do, you know, left foot, right hand, like we've always been taught as kids. This is just one way to do it. And as I said, this is like a block training or, or um, dictated finish. So I've told them what finish I want. This is not a randomized workout. This is me telling them. So I know they're working on this type of finish. Um, so you see this, right? Bounds, balance. Again, balance, balance, balance. Always, I'm always hitting on balance. Now we get to this next part, right? This is floaters. You can build in balance into your floaters, right? Some of these guys are going left hand, some of them are going right hand. Here we go two foot, right? And as we worked our way around, we would go two foot, we would go one foot, we would go Euro finishes. Um, these guys are I've told them, I don't care if you use these finishes ever in a game. Like this specific finish, you might never, ever use it. But I want you to always find your body control, always find your base, always be able to finish the same exact way. So whether we're twisting, whether we're coming out of a, a pin down, whether you have to avoid some contact in the middle of the key, always find your base, always find your core stability, always find your body control so you can finish the same way no matter what the situation is. Some of these guys are shooting from the free throw line in this clip, some of them are shooting inside. This is another way you kind of give them the ability, you tell them what you want and you let them work on different stuff. So 
maybe one day I tell them you have to shoot it from this point. Maybe one day I say, shoot it as far as you want. You want to go left hand, you want to go right hand. Now you see it's a right left Euro to what I would call a runner. I would say if it's a shot with two hands, it's a runner. If it's a one hander, that's a floater. That's my terminology. The guys all know when I say runner, they know what I want. So this footwork specifically, um, again, I'll share personal stories with you and how and why I do certain things. I was allowed at one point to work out with Steve Nash. And Steve Nash did this finish, you know, going right, left, Euro, going around the key, around the key, back and forth, and going off the left foot, going off the right foot, going both directions. So he was finding his body control. And that's kind of the first place I saw someone do that. And then I worked with DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry, and they said, work on the most difficult finishes you can. So when you get into a game, those difficult finishes are no longer difficult. Um, so that's kind of how I built my philosophy up and why we do certain things. So now, as I talked about video, you want to use video to teach your players. So whether I was in the NBA or I'm with young players like this, or I was coaching 12 year olds, um, these guys all want to see the highest skill level guys, how they do it. So I would say, show my guys here, look, um, for this example, this is Tim Hardaway. He's coming down the lane and he's going two foot floater, right hand. Now you see Karis Levert, two foot over the defense, two hands. Now you see Denzel Valentine, one foot going away from his body, throw it up with one hand. So I'll show our guys, then I'll teach them how to do it. And it kind of gets them to buy in a little bit more when they see the highest level guys in the world are doing this, right? Now, for example, you'll see a running hook. Just one more example of something we do that's in our offense. I play out of the elbow a ton in our offense we use, okay? So playing out of the elbow, you're gonna get running hooks across the paint. So again, here, we see Otto Porter, one foot running hook across the paint. Miles Turner, one hook, one foot running hook. Denzel Valentine, one foot running hook, right? Now you see Valentine again, he's very good at this. So I find a lot of examples of these guys. Now you see Thad Young going the other way. He's a lefty, throw it up, boom, lefty. Now you see how we incorporate this. So I tell my guys, when we play out of the elbows, most of the time, your first opportunity is an ISO because there's other action going on around you. So you get these guys to work on running hooks across the key. And they understand, now this is one on oh, right? Then we'll build it up to, to two on oh, or two on two, or one on one. Right. And we build up, we build up, we build up. There's a progression to everything you're doing. So again, these guys, you can't hear it, but they're messing around with each other. They're talking trash to each other. Again, another way of making it fun, right? Make it fun for these guys. They're kids. They got to have fun. So now I talked about, I, I labeled it slot cuts. So you guys all knew what I was talking about, but this is our Maccabi finish. Maccabi cuts, right? 45 cut, Maccabi cut. So now I have dictated to the guys, cut, put it down quick with the inside hand, and go inside hand finish. You can dunk it, you can lay it up, but you have to finish with the inside hand and imagine the defense is coming over. So again, we might do this the next day, and I'll be low, and if I fake at them, they got to finish, or they got, if I come over, they maybe go reverse, or maybe step around me, Euro step, like you see here, a reverse finish. If I fake and I go back, you go inside hand finish on the strong side. Um, and then you'll see the next step of it, we're teaching our passing out of it. So they'll Maccabi cut and we'll flare on the backside and we'll find a drive, kick, swing, right? So this is just the first step of one-on-o -on stuff where you these guys really feel like you're working with them individually. So now here you see, put it down quick, boom, Euro step, go outside hand finish. So again, we're teaching them all these different finishes and you're working on their skill work while you're also, without them really knowing it at this point, you're ingraining in their minds what you're going to do in your offensive movements. You see it on the other side. It's the same exact stuff on the other side. So then we can skip ahead. Um, now let's talk about, right, shooting and moving on to, to, to getting into your three on O stuff. So I think it's really important. And I, uh, one of my good friends, Cody Topper, was on here the other day. And we texted afterwards because uh, we'll share ideas with each other. And he talked about three on O, right? Building your, your themes 
and your movements through three on O stuff and then three on three stuff. Um, and they do it as well in Memphis uh, with, you know, uh, dictated movements and then randomized movements. So getting also, I'm really big on getting multiple shots. Everybody in the drill should get a shot. So we call, I call this drive kick swing. It's not a crazy uh, concept. I think a lot of people probably call it drive kick swing, but for us, the kick is the first pass, the swing is the second pass, right? So you see here, we Maccabi cut, we get back out, drive, kick, swing, you get three shots out of the drill. So now you're working on your shooting as well. You're getting multiple shots up for your guys. Now, that pass that my guy just made there, coming down the middle of the lane, he's a seven foot center. So we need to work on his passing with him next, right? Throwing chest passes through the key, probably not realistic. So we tell our guys, Get over the defense, throw it over your head, pass it outside the box. You're a box, pass it outside your box. But you see, we work on Maccabi cuts. Then we work on hammer screens, the flare screen. We call it a hammer screen. It's a big time terminology in the NBA. So you're working on different movements. Boom, hammer screen, get back out, drive baseline, drive, kick, swing. Drive, kick, swing, right? And then you get three shots out of it. So. We'll do this at the beginning of our practices, kind of drill it back in their heads. We want ball movement. We want the extra pass. This is the movement we want on the backside. I'm really big on always having backside movement. Movement on both sides of the court, I think, opens up so much. Um, and it's hard. You have to drill it. You have to drill it into your players to always continuously move. But this is our movement, right? So you'll see now we get into real games, real game action. And this is how it translates. Drive, kick, swing. Now here, boom, he drives down the lane, kick it, make the extra pass, drive, kick, swing, get the shot. Okay, you'll see a couple examples here. Now we're in transition. Attack, hit ahead, drive, kick, swing. The, the attack was the drive, the kick, the swing, the extra shot. Then we crash the glass. I, to me, a post pass is just as good as a drive. If it gets inside the key, a cut, a drive, a post up, same exact idea. You're, you're sinking the defense. You're sucking in the defense. You're collapsing the defense, whatever word you want to use. So this collapses it. It's your drive, then your kick, then your swing. Extra pass. Get your guys to move the ball. Here you see it again, right? He gets in the paint. It's a drive. It's a kick. It's an extra pass. It's another extra pass. He might've traveled there. I don't know. They didn't call it. So here you see again, now we're in a breakdown offense. Nothing's working. Terrible spacing right here. Driving at his own guy, but he collapses the defense. We kick it out. We make an extra pass. We get a wide open three from one of our best shooters. It doesn't drop, but that's still good offense, right? So we tell our guys, drive, kick, swing, drive, kick, swing. Now you see because you've ingrained in their minds, you've taught them we want the extra pass. We want the extra pass, right? Now you see from our guys, okay, we're running what we call heads. It's a pick and pop, okay? Break down the other big relocates. That's our toss game, toss. Hit the roller, kick it out, swing it to the extra guy. Boom, four and a half seconds on the shot clock. Nobody panicked, the ball kept moving. This isn't a game right here. We're down by one point in the fourth quarter right now. There was no panic. That's a huge shot from our guys. That ball kept moving. You see here, we're trying to run something. It's an ATO. It's not perfect, right? The defense is loaded up. Still really not perfect. It goes inside. There's your penetrating pass, your penetrating drive. We make an extra one. Still not there. Extra pass, extra pass. Boom, the shot clock. You see it under the hoop there. Two seconds. The ball just kept moving. It kept moving. Right? So your terminology becomes your culture. Drive, kick, swing. Right? It's ingrained in these guys' heads. Here, there's your drive, there's your kick, there's your extra, there's your second extra pass. We get a wide open shot and you see how excited the bench is. Right? This is fun for the guys now. They're finding each other to get each other extra shots. Or extra, they're finding each other to get shots through the extra pass. We track extra passes with our team. So you're getting love from me and the coaching staff, from your teammates, you're seeing it on the wall when you walk in, who's made the most extra passes, right? I'm leading the team in extra passes. So um, it's really a way, you know, I think any player, if they see their name up and they're atop a leaderboard, they want to be the best at it. 
And especially these young guys, these young guys just talk to each other. They talk smack all day long. They want to be the best at something. So it also gives you another way. If you're not the leading scorer, now you're the leading extra pass guy. You're the leading deflection guy. You're leading the team in something. It gives them ownership, right? So now we get to the three on oh. So you saw one on oh, you saw three on oh. Now we have our sets, pistol. Pistol always means the same thing in our offense. So we have dictated, there's, there's um, again, as Cody said the other night, you could do a whole clinic on pistol, the different movements. Here I've dictated what I want them to do in pistol, right? So I want him to hit ahead, get it back, get the flare, hit it back again, hit the roll or hit the pop guy. We're getting three threes out of this, three three-point shots. This is our toss game. There's no handoff. You see, that's a bad, bad look right there, the handoff. We want to toss. Toss ahead, create confusion. So pistol in toss, 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 right? Now he tosses, toss. No pick and rolls, no dribbles. The ball continues to be moved. We call it toss game. Some people call it Zoom, right? Um, I was with Brett Brown in Philadelphia um, with his G League team. He called it Noah's because Joe Kim Noah did it. But you see, we drilled our movement in pistol here. Okay, now we move on. You see it in a game. Okay, now we will have done that. And usually in a breakdown, um, that again will be pre-practice stuff before they stretch. I'll usually break it down to three or four different movements. You have to make 20 shots in each movement before we can move on 20 as a team, right? So now you're getting 80 makes as a team. You've already made 80 shots and gotten a ton of shots up before you even started your practice. So now you see pistol again, teach the guys how to make reads, teach them. The defense goes under, they keep backing up, boom, attack. Okay, that's pistol. Now the ball, toss, toss, toss. Okay, now our five man attacks out of it. And if you saw there on the backside, right, our big guy, number 12, he's turning to go set a down screen so they can't help. It's terrible defense anyways, but there's movement on both sides of the court, okay? And the toss game created confusion in their switches, in their pick and rolls. Boom, now we toss it, we flare it, they go under, now he shoots the three. Okay, now we throw it ahead, there's no defense, he attacks. But we've worked on all these things in our three on O. Now you see here, we built in, I told you terminology, pistol always means the same thing. So we run an Iverson cut here. And I called it, we call it a certain, we call it C, right? So now you're in C pistol, okay? C is Iverson, pistol is pistol. So we went Iverson into pistol, right? On the backside, you're creating side to side movement. The players know what pistol means. The one, if I can go back and break it down, the one who hit the guy, in the Iverson cut, right? He hits him on the Iverson. He goes away, gets flared. He's supposed to get flared by number one. Now you have movement on both sides. The nail is open. We can drive it, attack it, make a kick for a shot. Again, now you've got horn side, your classic horn side set. Toss it, get it back. This is horn side pistol, right? Horn side pistol. We've talked about Maccabi cuts. The ball's coming at him. He Maccabi cuts. Boom, make the extra kick out. So we've drilled Maccabi cuts, we've drilled pistol, we've drilled terminology. Now you get to your sets, horn side pistol, Maccabi cut out of it, we get a wide open three. Now the last set I have on here is we call it open. It's five out. NBA teams call it delay, right? Or open or what five out spacing, whatever it, whatever it is, we call it open. So they know I call open, it's five out. Open looks a whole lot like pistol, the only real difference is you hit the guy up top. So you can run pistol out of open. We could call pistol open and hit the guy up top instead of the five coming to set it. Here again, we've dictated the movements, right? We've dictated, hit him up top, go set the down screen, slip the down screen, right? He gets a layup or a different finish that maybe we've dictated. Maybe we've said, just go dunk it if you can dunk it. Just finish however you want to finish, something creative. Now it's a chase screen, okay? Pass and follow. He picks and pops, we get a shot. You can do a million things out of your three on O, different reads. You can then dictate it, have the guy cut all the way through, move to a second side, add a fourth player in, add a fifth player in. This is three on O out of it. So then, um, I believe there were, sorry, I skipped over it here. There are, there are examples of it once we get through the three on O. 
Oh, you know what? It's after this next screen. I apologize. So you see, we do ones, we do twos, threes, fours, fives on O. We developed our offensive identity and our rules. We talk about our miss offense, which is our transition. We talk about our make offense, which is our five out spacing, what we flow into, right? And we've drilled that in, in all these one, two, three, four, five on O. Um, then we get into live stuff in the half court. Uh, I do a lot of stuff with no dribble and one dribble, teaching the players how to read and move without the basketball and not just pound it, pound it, pound it. Um, we even start practice sometimes six on six, no dribble. So the court's more crowded and they have to move without the ball. And the players actually really love that drill. It's one that uh, my assistant coach said, one of his Serbian coaches that he played for when he was younger used to do. And he loved it. And our players love starting practice, six on six, no dribble. Um, so then I'll move into here. This is a um, couple more videos here. So miss offense, transition, flow, spacing. We have drilled this one on O, two on O, three on O, four on O, five on O. Then we do the classic roll the ball um, on the baseline. We do, uh, you know, one guy touch the baseline, get back. Then we'll do it um, out of a set. I'll throw it up. Boom, they got to get back. Sometimes they got to circle and, and run back in transition where the offense has an advantage. But we dictated what our transition spacing is. So here you see throw ahead, rim runner, perfect spacing. The corner's filled. We get a layup. Right? Now you see it again. The, this is our five-man pushing. He throws it ahead. We have a rim runner. The two, number four, and the other guy at the 45 should be in the corners. But we hit ahead. We get a layup out of it. Right? Now, again, we had a rim runner. You see him running ahead. We hit ahead. Right? Now that guy cuts through. We're going to have the guy filling behind right here. He'll come over to the 45. This guy will lift. This guy cutting through would get to the corner and we get into our spacing. They play bad defense. They don't load up. We get a layup out of it. Again, here we force a turnover. We get to our point guard. We're running the court. Rim runner, attack in the corners. You see our spacing over here, 45. Other corner, we attack. Then you'll see there, boom, our flare screen on the backside. We drive, we kick, now we redrive, and we get a layup out of it. But our spacing has been drilled in our breakdowns, in our player development. Again, this is our four-man now pushing the ball. Drive, kick, swing, extra pass, corners and 45s are filled. Now, once you get to certain points, you give players leeway. This is our last um, regular season game of the year this past year. This player right here, he's our best three-point shooter. So we throw it ahead. Right, he doesn't have much. Boom, he steps back, shoot that three. Some guys can take that, some guys can't. But you saw the other guys running into our spacing. Again, this is our five-man pushing the ball. I have no problem letting the five-man push it. Interchangeable pieces here. Um, he pushes, he hits ahead, we get the extra pass, we redrive. We get another drive, kick, swing to the guy who just drove it because we respaced and we get a foul on the three. We collapse the defense, then make them get out. Again, drive, kick, swing. If you can see the shot clock, there's two seconds in the half right here. No panic from our guys. Make the extra pass. Hit a corner three. Okay, we'll get like one or two more in the miss offense. Again, this is our five-man pushing with this group. Drive, kick it out. The spots are filled. He knows where the guys are going to be because we have drilled it over and over and over. Right? Now you get to your make offense. We, I showed you our five-out open offense. This is out of a make. Okay, we flow into it. Boom, five out, hit the top, look at him, Maccabi cut. Okay, they don't pull over, we get a layup out of it. You saw we drilled it three on oh, one, two, three. Now you add the other four or five on the backside. We let our players, really, there's no rules. You just have to move on both sides. You can flare, you can pin down, you can cut, you can slip it. So you'll see guys doing different things here. Now he passes and follows. They don't step up. He gets behind the defense. We make a lob, but we have our spacing ready for threes, okay? Now, he cuts, not open. We hit it back the other way. Now they just go pin down. Again, this is our second last game. We're just playing out of open. They're making reads. What does the defense do, right? Number seven, number seven, if you watch here, he's pinning down on the near side, okay? He doesn't get anything. He stays in. No, now he respaces. He ends up getting a kick out three because he respaced. He got to our spots. The post guy threw it blindly because he knew he was there. Okay, now we repin down. This was not a play. This was a read, right? And you see right here, we got one guy 
we cut in, we have our corner filled, we have a, a trail pass, and we have a guy up top. This by far is my favorite clip of the season. We don't end up making the shot. We're swinging it, we're moving it. Okay, it's not there. What do we get to? Boom, now we're in our five out open spacing. They, they reloaded, re, re-spaced, moved the ball a couple times. We got the ball up the court at about 21 on the clock. It, moved, it gave a chance to move and look for something. Now we're in our five out. We Maccabi cut, he pass fakes, he sets a ball screen. They play bad defense. We get them to make a mistake, right? And now we hit him. He just fumbles the ball. And instead, we don't get a wide open shot. We get a contested three. But that's okay because the ball moved. We used a bunch of the shot clock. Again, ball moves. Now we pin down out of it. Pick and pop. They don't read it right. These guys are just making reads on how they're guarded because we've drilled all this stuff. We've put coaches. We've had them play three on three, four on four right? And we've dictated finishes, right? That's the play you basically just saw um, in the three on O. We swing it up top. He sets a back screen. Then he slips it. Boom, he gets a layup. Okay, we have drilled it. Then we've told him, we've showed him on film. You're, you're building your players up out of your sets by using your terminology, by using your movements. And again, I apologize if I'm being repetitive here but I'm a big believer in um, repetitiveness and consistency. Consistency is the key to getting better. So again, here, here's a clip, right? Staggering away was not the play, but that's what the read was. Now, instead of hitting him up top, he curls it because they went over. There's no help side and we ended up getting a layup out of it. And then we ended up putting that play in later on. We called it open double. Okay. So these players can teach you stuff. Again, here's a guy, most guys, bad shot. This guy made 73s in 54 games. That's an okay shot for him. I'm going to live with that. Okay. So you see, again, how we built from the ground from one on O to five on five um, in, in our sets. Um, and then lastly, I know some, some people like to see, well, or, or they don't believe, you know, how realistic is this? You'll see it here. This is a real practice plan. I just took a random one. Um, I noticed it was New Year's Day. I'm sure the players love that we practice on New Year's Day. Um, but you'll see we did ladder. Then we did four basket layups. We have four baskets in our gym. We dictate the move, the ball handling move, and the finish. Then we do toss, competition shooting out of our sets, open wide, and C2, right? So C2 would be an Iverson play. Um, then we do a defensive drill to reinforce that. Then we do this baseline closeout drill, which – takes your offense, your defense, you play out of open wide, you see the progression there. We went toss shooting out of open wide. Now we do a live four on four drill where it's defense and offense out of open wide. Okay, I don't dictate anything. I tell them we dictated it before, now you're playing out of the set. Then you do shell defense. I think every single day, every single day do shell defense. Um, We do shell live, no pick and rolls. So the ball has to move, the bodies have to move. Um, then you go four on four, one dribble out of certain sets you have. And then we eventually get to five on five, but everything you see, we do here. Um, once you get through the stretch is live, basically, uh, multiple action is not a live drill, but it builds into your baseline closeout live drill. And then you, everything is live competition. You're building a competitive mindset. Um, and then we usually end with some sort of competition shooting, whether it's two baskets or free throw game, first guy to 25 points whatever that is. Um, and then I snuck the picture in there because we weren't able to finish our season this year. I, I have to, you know, let you guys know this is an amazing group of players and they're not all pictured there, but we were voted team of the season um, because they weren't allowed to crown a champion technically. Uh, but within Germany, we were 35 and one. Um, I got lucky to have an amazing group of players. I had, you know, the, the guy in the middle there is a seven foot um, future lottery pick in the NBA. Uh, and then there's seven national team players there. So I was ama- I got lucky to have an amazing group of players, but um, I've taken the things I've learned over the years to, to build them um, up to this group and, and, and hopefully build their basketball IQ and make them better people and better players. Um, so with that, I think I went a little bit over there, but um, that's, that's basically what I got for you guys. Um, and then I'll take any questions anybody might have. That was great stuff, Coach. And uh, yeah, we do have another uh, another session starting in this room. Uh, so I, I, we, but we also had a couple questions. So uh, I maybe we can get to one or two. And I'll make then, them quick. Uh, I apologize. 
it, you know, it's, it's my fault with the technical difficulties. Um, but, and then it, if you have any contact information that yeah. maybe they have further questions, they could reach out. Um, any on, uh, I can give you to you right now. It's my Twitter is dgale14, G-A-L-E. Um, and, and anyone can message me on there or my Instagram is just dgale. Um, and that's all on the website on my profile on there. Awesome. Okay, so first question, um, how do you find balance between not complaining about what players can't do, but also finding areas for improvement? Uh, so I think it's really important to uh, have meetings with your coaches all the time, take their input, and kind of come up with a plan of how you're going to make this guy better. Of course, we're all going to complain about certain guys. I think the biggest thing my assistant coach this year has taught me is don't say the word stink. Nobody stinks. Don't say this guy stinks or he, he can't do this, he can't do that. If he can't do it, that's going to be on us to make it so he can do it. At the end of the day, as a coach, you are going to be judged on how much better your players get. And I learned that in the NBA. So figure out a way to make them better. For sure, you're going to talk about it amongst coaches, but don't be negative with them. Absolutely. And then uh, this one says, when you mentioned balance earlier in the presentation, are you talking about physical balance, like staying upright or like holistic balance with <laughs> mindfulness or diet or something else? Uh, so when I mentioned it, I was really talking about physical balance, um, you know, having a wide base, getting your hips twisted around correctly, finding your core strength, all that. But I am a big believer and I make my guys do yoga and clear their heads. Um, and I try and send them um, quotes every single day if I can. We watch a lot of movies that are about sports, but also about a bigger picture. Um, so I am a big believer in mindfulness and I do yoga myself all the time. Um, and I try and share that with the guys, but the younger group, you, you know, with 16, 17, 18 year olds, they've got enough going on with their body changing and their friends and their girlfriends. And it's hard to get mindfulness through to younger groups. <laughs> for sure for sure and then uh we have time for maybe one more uh this one says uh what are some other ways you can simplify uh you talked a little bit about switching everything as one way to simplify things is there any other ideas that you have for simplifying uh yeah so i, I think as coaches we have a tendency to overcomplicate everything um i you know i watch a lot of stuff and there's a million ways to 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 do um, anything really a million ways to skin a cat, right? That's what people say. So I think really figuring out what you value the most, figure out what you value the most. And, and, um, it's on you to figure out a way to whittle that stuff down to one, two, three bullet points. So I forgot to mention at the beginning here. Um, I think it's really important at the end of every single season that you go back and you take notes about what you learned that year. And by doing that, with one year, two years, three years, you're going to develop your own philosophy and develop what you think is the most important thing or things, Absolutely. multiple things. Right, right. Well, coach, that was great stuff. And I'm sorry to have to cut it off with some good questions coming in. But uh, thank you again so, so much for your time. This was excellent. Thank you for having me. I appreciate everyone who, um, who joined and I hope I was helpful. Awesome. Thanks so much, coach. Stay safe out there. All right. You too. Have a great night, everybody.